and welcome um, to the uh, webinar tonight organized by Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group. Um, welcoming people to tonight's um, webinar. This is great to see people arriving in, in the room. Um, while people arrive, I'd just like to locate tonight's webinar. It's part of a series of webinars organized by Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group. Um, they followed a theme of mapping a just transformation. So we in these webinars are looking not just at the urgent need for a just transformation of society to tackle the climate crisis and the other crises that are connected um, that we're facing in society today, but also actually exploring what would it mean to have a just transformation of society. Um, previously, we've had the Lucas Plan um, and the film, The Plan, that explored how trade unionists were able to plan a transformation of their um, factory from, um, from producing military equipment um, to uh, socially useful employment. Tonight, what we're looking at with the uh, discussion of the film Burned, um, our trees, the new coal, um, we're looking at what must not be part of a just transformation. Uh, we're looking at those as I say, technologies, that's not the quite, the, quite the right expression. We're looking at those things that are being positioned as part of a green future, but will actually not provide us with a green future and will instead actually be part of the same problem that we're trying to tackle at this moment in time. Um, absolutely delighted to have um, the filmmakers with us, or two of the filmmakers with us tonight, uh, Chris Hardy and Lisa Merton, both joining us from the US tonight. So absolutely thrilled to have you here um, and absolutely thrilled that you're going to be able to explore with us in a little bit more detail the film, the arguments um, and where next in terms of the activism that we need coming out of an understanding of this, of this issue. Two other speakers joining us tonight, which again is absolutely fantastic. Uh, Sam Mason, um, who is policy officer with the PCS Union, a climate activist in her own right. Um, and Peter Dean, who's a climate activist with Biofuels Watch. We'll say a little bit more about Biofuels Watch later. And also is a member of the Campaign Against Climate Change um, steering committee. So absolutely fabulous lineup tonight. You've all, uh, if you're here on the webinar tonight, you've all received the link to the film. I really hope you've had a chance to watch it um, prior to this Q&A. Um, if you haven't, I uh, really would massively suggest that one of the first things you do is to go and watch it. But hopefully those of you who are joining us tonight have had a chance to see it. We're going to start with Sam um, tonight. We're going to take any questions that people have got in the chat. Uh, so p please pop questions in the chat. We're going to start with Sam because Sam needs to head off and join another uh, webinar. So to um, introduce Sam again, welcome Sam uh, PCS. What Sam's going to do is give us a little bit of a framing of why this is an absolutely crucial issue for trade union activists and why as trade unionists we need to um, challenge this as, a, as a, 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 a some kind of method of creating jobs in the new uh, in a new, in a green economy. So um, Sam, I'm going to hand over to you um, for, for giving us that uh, trade union uh, framing and uh, and we'll, we'll take any questions to Sam in the, in the chat. Thanks Suzanne and um, thanks for inviting me um, to be able to participate in this webinar tonight and I am genuinely sorry that I can't stay for the whole event. I really you know, would like to hear the conversation obviously with the, the filmmakers around the film and it's a really fantastic film so I'll certainly be promoting it out to PCS reps um, as, as part of my, my day job and making sure that we have some discussion about it within PCS trade union. Just for those who may not know PCS is actually a civil service trade union um, so we, that's the main government departments and also in public bodies such as museums and galleries and we have privatised services as well and um, so I'd just like to bring solidarity from my union to this event and obviously for everybody and the, the, the work that they're doing in terms of the COVID crisis which has included PCS members being on the front line of this as well and I think we've learned many things and I'm sure this has come up in other 
discussions and events that you've run about the impact of the COVID crisis and showing us actually just what we can do and all the things that we did, we've did we been told for years that wasn't possible are in fact very much possible. But I think there's one thing we can't have is any level of complacency around the climate crisis, which is still very much here. And in case anybody missed that big statistic that came out last week and missed everything else that's going on, um, the atmospheric CO2, CO2 levels have now reached a 3 million year high at 4 uh, 417 um, ppm. Um, so I think that just shows because everybody's just sort of been thinking, oh, we've seen carbon emissions drops, we've seen the air get clearer. And actually, because carbon stays obviously in the atmosphere for so long, um, we've actually not saved very much, although it has clearly given us an indication of um, how we could live with some quieter skies, cleaner airs, and in a, in a very different way. But I think one thing as well that it, it's shown us um, is that when all this is over, clearly the environmental crisis is still here, but we're running now into these um, kind of conflation of, of crisis and issues because we've obviously still got the COVID pandemic, which is going to go on for some time and a, a global public health crisis. Um, we, we're going to have an economic and social crisis of very extreme severe measures, which um, we were clearly already in before COVID, which is just going to be worse. And we're still going to have the climate crisis. And there's very worrying um, noises coming out about sort of green new deals and green recovery from the conservative government, um, not from the activists and those of us that are obviously working around this kind of just transformation recovery um, post COVID or even in the, the COVID crisis. And I think one thing is, is not to be fooled by any of that. Obviously, the language and rhetoric of this government is not the kind of response that we'd be hoping to see or the transformational changes that we've been hoping to see but um but i think one thing we have to be clear about we're already in a transition the aviation sector has been quite literally grounded the oil and gas and also the oil and gas sectors um run into deep trouble it was already in deep trouble with the oil crisis before the pandemic hit um but these changes are now already happening and we're already seeing loads and loads of workers that are going to be laid off on the back of this crisis. Now they might use the excuse of the crisis, but a lot of these layers were probably already intended to happen. Now, some of these things, obviously we want to see transformations in these sort of two key areas that I've mentioned, but what we're seeing at the moment is not going to be a justice transition or lead to the kind of outcomes that we would hope for and the, the big um, economy-wide transitions that we need. So I think in terms of coming back to the whole issue about the, the, the film and um, the, the biomass and bioenergy as the new coal is a really important one because we've seen a lot of false solutions in the past. And I know this has been a big discussion. We have the problem um, that this is seen as a renewable energy and is a big component of both the UK and obviously the European renewable energy mix. And I think a lot of people, when they get very excited about the energy transition and they say, oh, look, the renewables figures going up, there's very little analysis what actually is um, comprised within those figures and where the renewable energy is coming from. I know others will we'll talk about this probably um, throughout the rest of this discussion, but clearly there's also issues around the subsidies that are going into biomass and um, is issues around jobs, there's issues around the, the wider environmental impacts and obviously the importation of wood and all the false carbon accounting that's going on. Um, so I, I think, you know, some, some of the lessons that you're learning out of this, I mean, this is one thing that's quite interesting in, um, in the civil service, we have something called Greening Government Commitments and they just released a report a couple of months ago about how they're meeting their own carbon targets. Now they're doing very, very well. They're, they're actually reducing their, their carbon, but why are they reducing their carbons? Because they're actually closing down large sections of what we call the government estate. But of course they're not looking at, so for example, now where many of us are working at home, how we account those carbons into those, those budgets as well. So obviously one of the things that comes up in the film and around the whole of this sector 
of, is around the, the false um, accounting. But um, without um, going on too much longer, I think um, one thing we have to see right now is we've got a huge opportunity or we've got a huge moment that's going to be lost. Now, I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic than most people, and it's great to see people very optimistic about um, what what's sort of happening at the moment. But I think as trade unionists and as workers, we really need to have deep conversations and trade change the way in which we're working together across our movement and start looking at this as a whole economy. And that has to be around issues of public ownership, which we need public ownership for our energy system, um, the, the pamphlet which we wrote and which was referred to energy democracy and just transition is very much building on those arguments in which um, we have as part of a, a global trade union initiative that we will not see the transformations in our energy system in the way we want, in the way which protects workers and communities, unless we take back ownership of all the energy from generation, transmission, distribution to supply um, and bring that back under forms of democratic control because one thing we don't have and again which gets borne out in the film when you look at cutting down trees to burn and then their replacement is we do not have time. We do not have time for offsetting. We do not have time to say that these things can grow back and it'll all be all right. We, we all are aware of the IPPC report in two, 2018 um, and the very urgency of the situation that we're in now. So we need to use this as a very big opportunity. We need to start having those um, conversations across our unions on a sectorial level rather than fighting for um, just individual spaces within these debates because we, if anything, this crisis has highlighted to us, but I mean, obviously most of us already knew this, is that the things around the growth inequality, the issues around racism, um, the issues around transition, they, they were already existing, but this has just been starkly exposed. So we, we've got to rise up to these challenges now and also join the protests on the street and link all these things together because we are now in this moment. We've talked a lot about just transition in our trade union movement and the labor movement fighting for these words in the Paris Climate Agreement, for example. We're now in real time with this. This is when we have to start practicing all these things that we've been talking about. And this may just be our last best opportunity. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there and hand back to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Sam. You, you have touched on, I think, so many central issues um, about the way that we respond to the greenwashing, the, the attempt by the Tory government to pursue this, these, these kind of infrastructures that don't really move away, uh, maintain certain businesses uh, without any kind of real investment in the transitions that we need within our, within our society that are based on social, economic and racial, and racial justice. Um, it's just not happening. It's not at all, no surprise from the Tory government part of the thinking. Um, but we do have to think therefore about how we mobilise, how we harness um, and how we link up the different struggles that are taking place at this moment in time um, to understand and create that just transformation. But can I just stop there for one second because I don't see any questions to Sam in the chat. Um, if there are any questions or if anybody wants to pop their hand up, any of the participants want to pop their hand up with a question that they have. Um, while I'm just waiting, um for any questions there sam you mentioned earlier on in in the discussion in your introduction i should say uh, about what the tory government are kind of you know, the kind of green recovery that the tory government are talking about and why that is a long way away from what we want to happen could you just flesh that out just a little bit before we take in some of the questions yeah thanks suzanne um I think, I mean, one thing that the Tories are very good at is picking the words of activists and they've done this. We saw them do this around like national living wage and, and things like this. Um, I think when you start, I mean, obviously they haven't announced in full what their, their sort of package of measures are going to be, but they've started to use phrases like Green New Deal and Green Recovery. Um, but when you hear 
things that they're talking about, for example, carbon capture and storage. Now, unfortunately, trade unions love carbon capture and storage, um, so they'd be very happy about this. Um, they will talk about things like um, hydrogen, but hydrogen for natural gas, not, not green hydrogen. So, again, trade unions love um, things like this as well. But for us, these are not the solutions because one thing, particularly if we, we look at energy, that this is the problem when we don't approach these issues from what we call a, a whole economy approach because it inter intersects across with everything else, it intersects with construction, housing and retrofit, it inter inter um, interchanges with transport, etc. So all these connections have to be made across the whole economy so we get a broad understanding about how when we're looking for example, of workers transitioning or creating new jobs, um, that we're not just trying to model on a basis, well, you had a job in the fossil fuel sector, so you'll get a job in the renewable sector, for example. Um, you know, we need lots of engineers, we need lots of construction workers to do many things in, um, you know, within climate jobs. And I'm almost personally at a point where I wish we just stopped calling it a green economy. It's just an economy that we want, um, which is framed around the sort of climate jobs. Um, kind of discussion, let's create jobs that lower greenhouse gas emissions, let's create jobs that actually are about justice and real equality um, and let's, that's, that's where the transformational um, changes come from because um, we have to address the structural inequalities there and which are brought about by capitalism, we have to address capitalism as you know, inequality is, is, is inherent in capitalism. So if we, we don't have those discussions and just looking for like for like swaps, then we're never going to move beyond or into these, um, the, the new place where we need to be across the whole economy. So I think that they're the kind of kind of deeper discussions that we really need to start happening. And that, that's hard and it's difficult and nobody's saying it isn't, but I think with millions of workers, the potential to be laid off is going to be much harder and difficult in the, the coming months. So I think that's where we need to be at the forefront of that. So I'm, I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask you to have a quick look at the chat. Um, if you don't mind, there's a couple of questions in the chat to you. And while you do that, I'd like to ask if Claire can just um, give Tahir access um, to the forum. Tahir, you've had your hand up, so I think if you have a question, it'd be great to bring you in. Um, and I'm going to take a couple more questions to Sam and then we're going to move on to uh, Lisa and um, to Chris. Um, Tahir, you, if you unmute yourself, Tahir, yeah. um, bring yourself on screen or, or whatever, however you're comfortable. Tahir, you have a question or a comment? Uh, a comment. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I am unmuted. I'm not sure if I'm on camera or not, but uh, never mind. You're not on camera, but we can hear you. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, yeah, it was a comment really about uh, the film because I watched it earlier today. Um, and I mean, I'm not going to repeat all the arguments that uh, that Sam gave because obviously we're all, we're on the same page in that respect, both coming from the PCS Union and advancing those policies. Uh, but the thing. The thing I observed about the film, which kind of intrigued me, was um, and it's not a criticism of the film itself. It's about a, 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 what emerged in the course of the film, which is um, I work in aviation. And it, part one of the things about aviation is aviation noise. And there's a certain element of uh, anti-aviation sentiment, which is really just about noise and which says, well, if you could move the noise somewhere else, then we're happy and we don't care beyond that. And I was thinking as I was watching the film that firstly, the European Union, I, I absolutely, I was absolutely flabbergasted at the idea that the European Union could um, uh, countenance the kind of programme that they did in terms of the soliciting of, of uh, wood pellets and all the damage that did in America on the basis that they were going to meet their targets when we absolutely know that the answer to uh, climate change is global, just as the uh, the impact on climate change at the moment is global, so the, the response to it has to be global. So it seems to me incredible that you could kind of segment it in that way and said, well, if we're doing our bit, then we don't really care what's going on uh, in, the, in the US. And conversely, I also felt, uh, understandably on the part of those communities, I guess, that seeing the EU, that those nasty Europeans across the ocean were the enemy, 
And that if you got rid of those, then you could, everything would be all right. Again, it's a case of you need to transcend those kind of geographical limitations in the same way that you do, as Sam described, about the segmenting of the economy. There's also geographical segmentation. You need to overcome those barriers and recognise that the only way that we're going to uh, achieve the kind of uh, change that we need and, and transformation across the economy and across societies is at a global level. Um, that was really my observation, Suzanne, and th thanks very much for calling me in. That, that, that's great to hear. Um, as we progress through the rest of the webinar, I'll, I'll look for any hands of people if they want to ask questions if we have time. For this mo at this very moment in time, I'm going to go back to Sam, clearly to his reflections on the film um, are things that Chris and Lisa will no doubt pick, pick up on when they when they um, contribute. Um, but Sam, can I just ask you to perhaps make your final couple of comments in relation to those questions and anything else that you think is relevant before we move over to Chris and Lisa? You're on mute, Sam. Oh, thought I'd unmute myself. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, thanks for those questions and points in the chat. I think really useful. One specifically from Joshua. Um, is there any way PCS members in government departments can help challenge the so-called CO2 accounting error? Um, I'll take that back. Um, that's a good question. I think we, we should raise that. Um, I know obviously our, our members that work in these jobs like others are experts in these things so we'll certainly find a way how we can raise that because we're we're always challenging the um, accounting errors in relation to what the government puts out in terms of green government commitments which I mentioned. And from Les, um, in, in terms of the market-based measures, yeah, that's Absolutely, I think that is a problem. I think targets is always the, the, the problem as well. Um, we do need to get beyond that kind of um, climate policy. And I think one thing I, I didn't touch on, which I was going to mention, I'll just make as my final comment. I think we always approach these, these discussions from the wrong way around. Um, it's not about what energy we need, it's about what we need energy for, what the energy system is for, who it's for you know, why, why we have energy and why we're using it. And I think this is why we never get to the real solutions. For, so, for example, the really obvious one that we should be doing the energy um, retrofits of our homes and leaky buildings, for example, because that's not the one that obviously the industry wants. And to be honest, it's not the one that a lot of trade unions want because it's not preserving the jobs in the traditional fossil fuel areas. Um, so I think if we change how we approach it, then we start coming to very different solutions and they certainly won't be um, negative emissions technology because our solutions are quite often actually it's not so much about the technology. It's about looking at the social aspects of it and our social relations to energy and energy as a system and how it interacts across all our parts of the economy. So um, I make that my final comment so you can get an opportunity to get your other. Um, panelists in and thank you again and I am genuinely so sorry I can't stay for the the rest of the discussion but I'll certainly look at the uh, recording later. Great. Thanks thanks so much Sam and um, it, obviously it, it's a shame you can't stay with us for the whole session but it, it's really been valuable having you here for the for the time that you have been able to be with us tonight. If there are any further questions to Sam because she's raised so many important things um, uh, please you know stick them in the chat and we'll, we'll forward them and continue this discussion in you know, as many different forums as we can. Um, yeah, it is. It was a great way of phrasing it. What do we need the, the energy for? And some of what's happened in the last few months has shown us that there are so many things that we do, which we don't necessarily need to be doing. Hence, we've had a reduction in um, some of our energy use over this, over this period of time. Um, so the film Burned, uh, Burned it, Arteries, the New Coal, um, is a film that I had been wanting uh, let me rephrase it in this way, it was, was a film that I was encouraged to watch by Pete um, on the webinar here um, and I had never found time to be able to watch it. Now that was a real silly thing for a climate activist to have done, to postpone watching um, this film for such a long period of time and really it was only when we had the opportunity to host this webinar that I eventually got round to watching the film. I do want to say, I, I think the film is absolutely stunning. Um, really genuinely um, feel that um, it has put a missing link 
in my understanding of a whole number of things that were going on um, and um, is an absolutely must see for any and all climate activists, for any and all trade unionists. We'll have a little think before we finish today's webinar about how we can actually you know, build up an awareness of this within the trade union movement, um, within our own activist, uh, activist circles, but the film is stunning. Um, Chris and, and, and Lisa, perhaps if I can bring you in 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 this uh in this order um actually i'm gonna i'm gonna let you choose we haven't decided this beforehand but you obviously thought yourselves about what you want to bring to the webinar um tonight um i think let's just start from there about where where you know what you feel is it the useful message from you in terms of why you were doing the film what you hope to achieve from it and and what for a uk trade union based audience, a bunch of activists, you, you feel um, we need to be uh, thinking about and organising around. So Lisa, Chris, which would we like to go first? Lisa, Lisa. Why, don't, why don't you go first? Yeah, okay. great. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Well, this is a, this is a really uh, difficult time in the United States um, because of the events of the last couple of weeks um, with the lynching of, basically the lynching of um, George Floyd. And um, it brings to my mind um, the, the compounding of inequities. Um, so we know that from the COVID-19 virus that people of color, particularly black and Latino people, have died um, in, in numbers that are double the white population. And so when I say um, compounding in, in inequality on inequality, I think about the biomass plants and I think about the oil refineries and I think about the dumps and I think about the nuclear waste dumps and I think about how they are all in communities, um, mostly in communities of color and in communities that are um, struggling to begin with. So if you look at the place where these pellets come from that are burned at Drax, for example, I've been to those communities. Um, they have nothing. They live in food deserts. Um, their environment is really destroyed. Um, they live with noise. Um, the, the gentleman who, who called in before, Tahir Latif, he talked about the aviation noise. These people live with noise because the white communities don't want that noise. Um, they don't want the dumps. They don't want the, the dust from the biomass plants. So it's just, for me, I'm full of rage right now about what is going on in this country. And I just see it as a, as a double, um, you know, a, a double inequity that, that the, that's been going on all along, but now it's come to the surface. And, and I see that as hopeful that it's come to the surface in the way it has. And I think that um, these communities that have been so marginalized and so dumped on literally um, are, are really, they're speaking out and it's what we need to hear as a, as a, as a world. We need to hear from, from these people. And it's very closely connected to the biomass industry, as I've already said. So um, there's a huge assault kind of to change um, my tone a little bit um, on the forests of the world. And um, that comes from, uh, what's that oil? Palm oil. It comes from biofuels, um, which is what palm oil is also used for, for, but it's also palm oil is used in our food. Um, it comes from the paper and pulp industry, and it comes from the biomass industry. And the thing that's most egregious about the biomass industry is the lies. <laughs> I don't think anybody's lying so much about the palm oil industry. We know what that's doing, but, but we're told that the biomass industry is green and clean and sustainable and renewable. Well, it is none of those things. And Two of, two of the ideas that we really need to erase are that it's renewable because we are told by, by the experts, by the scientists, by the climate scientists that we don't have time 
So to say that the trees are a renewable, burning trees is a renewable energy is just totally ludicrous. I mean, trees take forever to grow. They take 75 to 100 years to grow to sequester that carbon in themselves and in the soil. So that needs to be, that, that definition needs to be gone. The other thing is that subsidies, um, you know, it's, what is it, Pete, you can probably tell me the, the number, but it's, I think it's over a million pounds a day in subsidies that are, are given to the, to the biomass industry. It's now almost two. Oh, it's two. See, I'm way off. Okay. Um, and that, you all pay for that. You know, you pay for that in your, in your electricity bills. Um, and so um, here in the United States, we're also providing subsidies. We, we don't so much have the biomass plants that are burning pellets for electricity. Here, they're just outright burning the chips. They don't export the chips because it's much more um, economical to export the, the pellets. So we're dealing here in Vermont. We have a city called Burlington that calls themselves um, carbon neutral. Um, they have a, a large biomass plant that burns chips. Um, we have another plant in Vermont. There's a big one in New Hampshire where Chris lives across the river in the next state over where they are burning um, chips for, for energy. And you know, oh, we have so many forests. There's forests all over the place here. That's always the excuse. Oh, there's trees over there that are gonna sequester the carbon that, that um, you know, was in the trees that we're burning. That's not the way it works. You know, those trees over there don't know, you know, they don't know, as Mary Booth would say. So um, I'm at a point where I'm, um, I'm actually um, not feeling very hopeful. I'm not feeling very hopeful about what's happening with the biomass industry. Um, and I know that Chris and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, because it's full steam ahead, you know, the lies, the renewable, sustainable, um, all of those lies are just moving ahead. Denmark is going great guns. The EU, I think 70% of their power comes from biomass, you know, 70% of their electric power. Um, so I've been feeling that we need to have a huge ad campaign so that we reach people on a kind of propaganda level. I know that probably sounds um, crass or something, but it just seems to me that we need to reach large numbers of people in a hurry. And um, somehow that's what the biomass industry does. Somehow their message reaches people more easily, more loudly and more clearly than our message you know, that it's sustainable, that it's green, that it's clean, that it's renewable. That's what people think of biomass. And that's what we thought of biomass in the beginning. And that's why we made this film. All right, I'm sorry, I'm a little outraged, but um, <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> Chris. Chris, you would you like to in? jump straight in? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Or maybe there's questions of me, I don't know, before I, but however you want to handle it. Please. Not at the moment, Lisa, in the chat. Okay. So I think let, let's just jump straight over to Chris and then we can start grouping some questions. Um, okay. the, I think it's right to be outraged though, Lisa. Um, Chris. Sure. Lisa said it all. Um, thanks everybody for watching the film, hopefully, and coming to the discussion. Um, Lisa didn't mention that the third filmmaker is her partner, Alan Dater. Um, I was the third person add-on, have known them for years, decades, and we'd worked together on other stuff. Um, and they invited me to join them on this film. And it was five years ago, it was 2015 that we started this journey. As she said, first thinking that when the idea was pitched to us to do a film on biomass, that it was a green thing, uh, learning very quickly that no, it was kind of a crazy thing, <laughs> anything but green. And so for the first two years, we followed our noses in the story. So it took two years to make the film. That was 2017. So it's been three years that we've been showing the film. And at first there were film festivals and that kind of audience. And then we've been doing screenings for about two years. Um, and like Lisa, it gets, um, it's, a, it's a trudge 
um, trying to get the message out uh, in front of enough eyeballs, in front of enough people to change things. Um, so you go through that cycle that any campaigner goes through. And I, and I didn't sign up really to be a, an activist. I'm a filmmaker. And, but here I am doing activist kinds of things reluctantly. I'd say reluctantly at first, but now you just keep moving forward because you know something about the world and you want to see it, uh, in a, you want to see it change. You want to see a different, uh, different outcome. Um, and so there, you know, recently there in the last year, they, there have been seeming small victories for the campaigners in terms of subsidies, uh, movement toward divestment and uh, the financial community and uh, having them not invest in the biomass industry, much like what goes on in the climate industry. It's a great tool. It takes a while to get traction. Um, but as Lisa said, um, the industry just steamrolls or clear cuts their way through forests. They just don't stop. So getting the film in front of people and having that matter uh, somehow is really our task right now and cha changing minds. And that always seems like a slow process. You know, I don't know how many are in this screening, but we've done over the last two years, probably 175 to 200 screenings, many of which we've been involved in at first, now with groups like Biofuel Watch doing screenings, many times we're not involved in the Q and A's. Um, and people, the, the sort of universal reaction to the film is, I had no idea that something like this was going on. What can I do? Hmm. What can I do? And, um, that's always the question of anybody getting involved in any environmental issue is, you know, what can I do? Does, does my little action matter? And I assure you it, it does, although uh, it seems like um, oftentimes the, the, the asks are so small, sign this petition, write this letter, write a letter to the editor, contact your policy maker, and you, and you sit there and you think, is this really gonna matter? Um, and all I'd say is that, you know, to, to change things, we all just can do what we can do. We take small steps, I'd say be persistent. And um, it seems like change is really slow. And I'd say it's slow uh, until it isn't which is much like what happened in the last couple of weeks with uh, police brutality in the United States and maybe in the world. So, you know, tipping point is an overused kind of phrase, but I think that's what happens when enough people are aware, uh, have the knowledge, change their values and take an action. Whatever that action is that you feel like you can take on any given day, however small it might be, it all makes a difference till it gets to some point where things flip. And I guess I believe that, and that's why, you know, we're still doing screenings and Q and A's three years in. Thanks, Chris. Um, Chris, th Chris and Lisa, there's, there's quite a few questions have come in, um, and I'm just gonna put a few of them to you. Um, just in uh, just in immediate response to Chris's last point there, and can I ask this to to both of you for your reflections on this? Lisa, you started off rightly framing what is happening at this moment in time in terms of the uprisings that have taken place globally, um, the way that the COVID crisis and and those many interconnecting crises that sort of are emanating from the same source of uh, an economy which prioritizes the interests of a small minority, profit making above the interests of the majority, the nature of the planet, the climate that, that we live uh, within and, and, and with the rest of nature. Um, and it's shone a light on, on this, but at the same time, we're now seeing this huge, wonderful mobilization which gives hope that change 
can come and will come. My question is, it kind of links to something that's in the chat. One of the comments in the chat is, is about, it said the comment was, indigenous people seem to have been left out of, of this discussion. So I just wondered if you could reflect on, in any way, does the issue that you're campaigning on uh, link to these questions around indigenous communities? And then my second question is about, in what way do you think this incredible mobilization that is occurring, in what way can that connect? Can we join forces in terms of the climate environmental movement? Are there any possibilities there of that kind of intersectionality um, and internationalism that is clearly so, so important to any success that we have? A uh, couple of other questions that were asked, which is about the huge subsidies um, that the biofuel industries and the biomass industries get and this all links back to market-based solutions so what can we do about that um can we move beyond that kind of climate policy and then final question was it was about are there any forms of biomass that are i don't feel you need to answer all these questions <laughs> answer none some uh, but are there any forms of biomass that are that are um okay is the question that was posed um, I, I, I'd like to address the one about um, indigenous uh, people in the United States. Um, we worked closely when we were making the film with the Indigenous Environmental Network, which is based in Minnesota. And we did actually film um, in the longer version of the film. Um, there's a 74 minute version of the film um, where we filmed um, in, on the, in the upper peninsula of Lake Michigan and the biomass plant there is the dirtiest plant in the United States. And that's one of the reasons that we filmed there was because it's the worst. Um, and it's on Keweenaw Bay, across the bay from um, a, the Keweenaw Bay Indian community. Um, and we did interview somebody from that community and we ended up not using it because it felt kind of like a token gesture. It just didn't feel right using it in the film because it, it, it just wasn't, um, a good representation, I think we felt. Um, but we have, they have used the film, um, various communities in the United States um, have used the film. Um, so they're not excluded. And I, I consider them to be people of color. So when I talked about people of color, um, I, I, I included them in that, um, in that wording. Um, um, the, uh, I just, there's just something that I saw here. Um, it says George Floyd's murder is bad enough in itself without distorting it. It wasn't a lynching. Well, those are not my words. Um, and I, we could, I could discuss that with you, um, one, whoever wrote that, but I, I don't want to take that time now, but it was tantamount to a lynching. Um, so now I've lost track of where I was going. Um, Chris, do you want to go on with um, some of Suzanne's points, questions? Um, um, forms of biomass. Wait, Pete's saying okay. something. Um, Pete, is, Pete raised his hand. Pete? So I don't want to cut you off, Chris, if you had a point to make. I was just going to say something about the indigenous uh, communities. Sure, and, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, of course, we also know about Standing Rock and the terrible problems with pipelines and water contamination that have been experienced from the um, indigenous communities of the USA. Um, biomass is possibly a bigger um, concern for the indigenous, indigenous communities um, in Canada. Um, there's biomass, there's a, a huge expansion in Nova Scotia, which directly impacts the Mi'kmaq um, people, of right. whom um, Cillian McAdam, the founding member of Idle No More is uh, as a member of that um, tribal community. In British Columbia, um, deforestation is, um, I, I, I can never remember the name, it's Yetsu Wetten, possibly, I apologize. Yeah, that's right, Yetsu Wetten. Yeah. yeah, they're suffering from the deforestation of British Columbia. Um, interestingly, I read um, recently that the, 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 it has been announced or um, in, in, in documentation, it's been um, referenced, that the tar sands are actually drying up and they will be coming to an end um, in the next two decades and that already they're looking for replacement um, fuel sources and the forests of Canada are, are, are in, their, in their sites for that. But just 
to conclude on the indigenous um, people's um, predicament in all of this, I'd like to also, let's not forget um, Southeast Asia, the palm oil expansion is, is devastating indigenous communities in, in ways that, that we, we, we can't comprehend. It, it, it is truly horrendous. And there are some really um, appalling films of um, community leaders um, being um, disappeared, um, which is also happening in South America in the face of palm oil expansion there and Eucalyptus expansion there. Um, Tasmania has a huge deforestation and a terrible impact on its indigenous um, population. So um, in the global south, um, the indigenous peoples are suffering dreadfully from um, bio, bioenergy, um, certainly, and, and things like palm oil and eucalyptus, which can be bioenergy crops, but are, are also used for multiple um, other uh, purposes. So, but um, in terms of um, North America, um, there's a huge, and it's going to become a, a, a matter of great urgency, the impact on the Canadian indigenous people. Pete, thank you. That was really helpful. Um, and Chris, can I jump back to you to see if you want to take any of the questions from earlier? Sure. But thanks, I, Pete. That was brilliant. Thank you. I think one of the last questions that you posed was about uh, if there were any forms of biomass that are okay. Is, was that the question? Um, that was one of the questions. Yeah. I'd say uh, no. <laughs> Um, uh, it's it's more complicated than than that, of course. Like the world, um, so there are uh, you know in this country and in Europe there are uh, uses of biomass that are for heating, as well as for uh, electricity. Drax is just electricity, and the electric conversion of biomass to energy is hugely inefficient. It's about a 25% efficiency. When you look at heat alone, it's probably 75% efficient. And if you do combine heat and power, maybe 85% efficient. So that's certainly a better way to use a tree, but um, we think there are other ways to get that energy um, that are more renewable less carbon intensive, wind and solar and other technologies being uh, much better for heat in the long run. In the area that we live, Lisa and I in New England, the very forested states in New England, in Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont, Northern New England, the most forested uh, for land mass of uh, just about any state in, in the United States, any of the states in the United States. And so we've got this abundance of trees in a very low population, and for years people have said, you, you know, we we have we have wood stoves in our house that we've used to heat. And 30 years ago, that was a really great idea, and we still do it. But we're using very low quantities of heat, a couple of I mean of wood, a couple of cords, and for the population that sort of seems to seems to work. As it scales up, as you start using it on a community scale. You know, if you don't do it too often, it does seem like, you know, the forests of that area, that local area can produce enough to heat a school or a municipal building. But things, things in any industry grow so quickly in terms of scale that then everybody wants to do that and businesses grow and they're trying to do bigger and bigger projects. And then there's a pressure on the forest and uh, even people in New England that are in the, the kind of biomass energy uh, world, and we interviewed someone again that we didn't use in the film, he just said, you know, you can get to a point where if you do this too much, the forest will suffer. And we're both, uh, Lisa and I, of the school probably that right now at this moment in time, the forests need to be doing something else for us and the planet rather than heating a building. And that's a sort of a greater, a greater good at this point, that they need to be used for sequestering carbon and are seen as a natural solution for, uh, you know, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah, thanks, Chris. 
Um, that was a really, really helpful answer to that question because I, I see that question come up often in environmental meetings where people are grappling with in what way could biomass be useful as part of a renewable energy mix. And, and Chris, that, that was a really, really excellent answer to that question, which I think clarifies it, the no, and that we should be looking at forests for different purposes within the, within the environmental campaigning um, solutions that we need as part of a natural, as a part of a natural solution. Um, Lisa, yeah, please. Can, Lisa, I just, can, I, can I just ask Lisa before you come in? A job, I, I wonder whether it would be possible to, if it's not, it's not, but to share a, a link to the, the Vimeo film perhaps for all of the participants, but not now. You have a, a question you wanted to answer. No, I just wanted to say that forests address the two greatest um, challenges that we face now, um, and that is loss of biodiversity and um, climate, the carbon sequestration. Forests provide habitat for biodiversity and they sequester carbon. It's a win-win solution mm -hmm. to save forests everywhere on the planet. Stop managing them, let them grow wild. As E.O. Wilson, the great biologist says, half the world needs to be wild for us to have any quality of life um, in the future. Yeah, great. Not just us, but all species. Yeah, ab absolutely. And and I do, and I feel that you both hear it, but here, but in the film, I think you make that point really, really well, as alongside the other arguments against against the use of uh, biofuels. Um, I, I'd like to, before we run out of time, and I, I'd like to sort of. Um, dedicate time so that Pete has enough time to kind of explain the biofuels watch campaigning that has been done and, and why this issue is so important to us in the UK given that we have Drax here and it is such a major uh, user of the wood uh, of the wood that's been exported um, and, and such a driver of this so Pete in a second I'm going to hand over to you I do want to just say one thing I don't know if how many of our participants today in the UK um, heard the uh, the news where the reports were very much about how our um, extraordinary use of renewables in the last few few days um, in the last few weeks and the decline in the use of coal and then segued really uncritically um, to the role of Drax to the potential future for carbon capture and storage and yet again repeated all of the lies around um, around around biomass um, that it's a zero carbon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that that argument is being pushed. And referencing what Sam was saying at the beginning, you know, any kind of green strategy from the government clearly is going to push this full and centre. Um, so the campaigning work that that Biofuels Watch do um, is absolutely central. It's a pleasure to have Pete here. Um, to talk through some of that campaigning work and what we what we need to do. Um, so, Pete, I'm just going to hand straight over to you if you can unmute yourself and, and, and just share a little bit more insight into what's happening in the UK and the campaigning work we need to, to now be part of. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, it's almost it's almost as if um, we carefully engineered the the script to cascade in this way because from Lisa's expression of um, um, grief at the, the current situation and Chris is referencing them to um, campaigning necessities and stuff. I, I, I can bring that to um, uh, um, uh, the verge of optimism um, because we've recently had two great um, successes in our campaigns um, and this is in relation to um, the subsidies or the new regime of subsidies that was, that was to be brought in for Drax and other bioenergy companies in the UK, um, which are called CFDs, Contracts for Difference. Um, we have been lobbying against these for years, and they, they have their own inherent dangers in that they're tradable instruments. They can be completely dissociated from their original purpose and be just sold on the stock exchange for um, um, their own um, intrinsic value, which uh, is not, uh, sorry, their non-intrinsic value for the pure commercial product value. Um, they, uh, the government have taken on board some of our, um, our criticisms and they've uh, upped the um, efficiency standards for the issue of new CFDs 
to um, 70% efficiency, which is beyond the capability of any known bioenergy um, generating um, uh, facility. So effectively, we believe now, by a field watch do, until we get our hands on more incisive knowledge, we believe that, that, that we can end our CFD um, campaign because we think that CFDs are now dead in the water. There will be no new power stations built on the basis of the new subsidy regime. Um, we also had a victory in Ireland um, of a similar nature. Um, and, and Chris and I um, both um, did public meetings in Dublin and our friend from North Carolina, um, Jack Spruill, uh, came to Ireland with me also to do public meetings. We've been campaigning with Antashka, Friends of the Irish Environment, Pro Ireland and other groups. Um, and we've, had, um, we, we've effectively stopped the building of any new uh, power stations. In Ireland, Ireland was heavily reliant on peat which, believe it or not, is, is, is worse than coal. It's, it's probably the most destructive form of energy that humanity can um, um, harness, um, if barring possibly nuclear. Um, but but um, the, board, the planning, uh, Board Planola in Ireland, um, the planning um, um, authority, have, um, again, increased the standards for greenhouse gas emissions and, and also um, more or less written off the possibility of commercial peat exploitation in Ireland, which means that three co-firing co biomass uh, and peat, uh, wood and peat biomass um, power stations in Ireland will not be going ahead. That means that there is only one remaining power station in Ireland, which we do not believe has any future um, at money point. So what this is, this relates directly to what Chris was, 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 was um, alluding to. This is people power in action. We did this. All of you who signed those petitions, you did this. We stopped the subsidies um, to a large extent in um, the UK, and we have stopped the building of, of, of biomass power stations in Ireland. For It looks like it's going to be for good. We do not know because, believe it or not, Ireland hasn't had a government for the last several months, and when they do form a new government, they're going to be trying to deal with um, the post-COVID recession. So, um, Fingers crossed for that, but but the, but but the, the the planning criteria are in place now to make it virtually impossible for that to go ahead. Um, in the UK, there are still the renewable obligation certificates, um, which were the subsidies. These were the levies that were put on your electricity bill to pay for the green element in your energy. Um, Drax has um, rocks. ROCs, uh, Renewable Obligation Certificates, for two of its um, turbines until 2027. Um, unfortunately, any power company that ha is financed by ROCs, um, it, um, it means that from the date of the commencement of their contract, they have 20 years to enjoy that levy on your bill, which means that you will be paying under a, under a bogus label of green you will be paying for forest destruction and global warming increases. Um, and that, so we want to redirect our campaigns that are the energies that you all put in to bring us that fantastic victory on CFDs. We want to go back to the rocks now. And we want to say, stop this destruction. Stop tracks burning 13 million tons of wood imported every single year. 13 million tons. Um, and, and at subsidies of... Um, as I said, almost two million pounds a day. It's that's not a viable business model in anybody's books. It's a it's a con, an absolute con. So we have great great grounds to stop this. We need your help. We need your little signature. We need your letters. Um, and um, I'm going to post. Um, I'll do it right now. Um, we have an open letter to the government about the rocks. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm going to put this in the message um, thing. Um, please download this. Please, please um, sign this letter and send it around to as many people as you can. Um, the CFDs were for future investments. The, the, the devastation that, that has been ongoing for many years was financed largely by the rocks. In fact, before the rocks surpassed their current um, rate, 
um, for, 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 for a few years, the, the, the ROCs, the Renewable um, Obligation Certificates, um, were the actual equal sum of the share dividends paid to shareholders in DRAX. So the taxpayer, the bill payer, was paying directly out of their pockets the share dividends for those people who had no conscience in where they invested their, their money for their future. Um, and uh, so it, it also, um, we really need um, to um, build our support, build our momentum. In the post-GDPR world, it's become more and more hard to um, recruit people to mailing lists and things like this. So um, I've asked Suzanne um, if, if I can ask you, the viewers, to um, go into the chat box and type BF if you um, would allow us to add your email to our mailing list um, and help us with um, the, the new campaign or the reinvigorated campaign to fight the rock. So that's what Biofield Watch are at at the moment. Um, and um, Chris, I, I'm sure you knew about that um, success that, 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 that happened in Ireland um, because it's been going around the, the US wood pellet forums and stuff like that. Yeah, we did, we did know about that and we yeah. knew that you would address it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Chris, Chris played his part in that too, personally. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Mm. So, um, Great. I've, I've posted the letter and I've asked you to put your um, um, signatures in. Um, and so uh, I just had a couple of things I wanted to say about, um, yeah, one, one thing I, I did want to say, um, which has been addressed in the chat. Sorry, Suzanne, I just wanted to get this okay. um, in because it's, it was addressed in the chat lists and it was about um, the poor um, suffering the effects of um, bioenergy production in the USA. Um, now, before we were presented with the magnificent film of foreign days. Biofield Watch were relying um, greatly, and we were holding um, our public meetings um, with another film, which was um, made by um, Sean Day from Real News. And that film is called Biomass Emergency. Um, and um, in that film, um, it clearly demonstrates that on this side of the Atlantic as well, Poor people are the ones who are suffering the um, direct impact of the importation of bioenergy. Up in Manchester and Liverpool, Chris, uh, so Sean walked around and um, was running his finger along people's cars and window ledges with the dust that was coming from the wood pellets and chips that were being offloaded for, um, from the ships into containers to be sent by train to drag. Um, the canals of Manchester, there's a film of wood just across them. And it's sickening because if you throw a stick into that, what happens is you see the water clear for a second. And then as the stick sinks into the water, the gunk just closes again over it. And that's wood dust. That's going into people's lungs in the poorest parts of the UK. Um, Grangemouth, Sunderland, um, Bransholm, um, these places are suffering directly too um, from the impact of, uh, of, this, of this dreadful um, industry. Um, Suzanne, do, do you want to? So um, you on? mentioned, um, Pete, thank you for that. And, and people, as you're talking, people are putting their details into the chat. We'll, thank you. We'll save that and share details with you Pete in terms of anybody who wants to be part of that Fantastic. can I just say I, I I didn't see that you you were trying to you were sharing something um the letter for the the latest part of the campaigning but I didn't see that appear in the chat so oh, really? you can just check um whether you were able to oh Claire has um, oh hang on that. oh yes it says uh um oh I sent it to Claire privately <laughs> that's okay Claire. that's okay so just share it share it in the chat um and uh Pete, I, I wonder if you could just yeah. mute yourself for one second, <laughs> uh, Pete, if that's possible. Um, so what I, I wanted to do, we, we, we have approximately sort of 10, 10 minutes left to finish. Um, and I just wanted people to um, just check in with the chat to make sure there isn't any remaining questions. Um, I, if there's time and space, Bill, um, could you mention this, but you need to tell me what the this is that you want 
um, to mention. So Bill, if you can just make sure before you leave, if you can uh, say what the, this is that you'd like. There's, there's Pete's uh, link that he wants you to start sharing, signing, publicizing, campaigning. Um, I, wa I, wanted to, I wanted to pose a question to everybody um, as one of the things to kind of wind up with. Do feel free to address something else if you want to. This, um, this as I mentioned in the UK today, um, a couple of news items were covering the fact that we've um, used hardly any coal and we've just focused on, uh, but, uh, we've just focused on renewables. Um, and then there was quite a big segue into Drax, as I say, a very uncritical segue into to Drax and the great things that Drax was doing and uh, the prospect of Drax using carbon capture and storage. I went to Drax's Twitter and on that Twitter, they had a link um, to a news item up in, the nor in, the, in Yorkshire, in the area in which Drax is based, um, the local radio station. And I listened in to that. And in that, there was an uh, exchange between the CEO of Drax and the, um, the guy, um, uh, so the, 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 the radio uh, host and uh, uh, allowing Drax quite an uncritical um, discussion about how this was a zero carbon energy source and, uh, and was gonna bring loads of jobs, loads of jobs to the region. 50,000 was randomly thrown in. So I, I want to just finish really on this question. We've, we've, we've spoken um, through all of our contributions tonight about um, the impact on poorer communities of the climate crisis, um, of the racism, the COVID, the COVID crisis, etc. But what happens over and over again is the exploitation of this jobs versus the uh, environment argument. Um, uh, focused particularly on communities that are suffering, who you know experienced those thirty years of neoliberalism, a loss of jobs, a loss of infrastructure, welfare infrastructure, etc. And I just wondered if if, you, if, you, if you'd be willing to address that question in the campaign against climate change trade union group we kind of focused on climate jobs and how we can create employment that that doesn't cause damage socially useful employment and tackles the climate crisis uh one final comment for me i noticed in the covid crisis here i don't know if it's been the same in the us um there's a real uh, desire for people to work in the nhs big uptake of people employ uh, looking for how how do they get a job working in the employer. And clearly that's motivated by being, wanting to be doing work that actually makes a difference for our society, not just for the individual, but for our society. So just, I'd be interested in a few final thoughts on, on that, because that seems to be the, the way that, that this industry and other industries, the juggernaut is on the basis of jobs, jobs, jobs. A false promise, it is a false promise, but I just wonder if, if I can take your, um, your thoughts on that. Lisa, would you like to, to, to start off and we'll, we'll just go around and finish up? Um, in, in the southern, in the southeastern United States, where the majority of the pellet plants are, um, it's, it's the wood basket of the world, really, the southeastern United States. Um, it's interesting how few jobs the biomass industry actually offers. Um, that is one of the things that they say when they move into communities. We're going to bring jobs. And it is, again, as you say, Suzanne, it's jobs versus the environment. But um, more often than not, it is not the people who are living in the communities that are getting those jobs. It's often people that are coming in from more distant communities. So not only are they not getting the jobs, but they're getting all the detriments of the industry. Um, I think that that was um, true in just about every small community that we visited. They were putting up with the detrimental parts of the industry and not getting any of the benefits. Chris, wouldn't you say that that's the case? Yeah, and if you're done, I'd love to add to this question because I'm so tired of hearing it. I've been hearing it for 30 or 40 years. And um, first of all, as Suzanne said, it's uh, not true. There never are a lot of jobs. <laughs> and they go, as Lisa said, to different people. But, uh, you know, technologies change, the world changes, things that we used to do, we don't do anymore. Um, 
ice harvesting. You know, we used to use that before refrigeration. There are no ice harvesting jobs anymore. So things change and burning wood is sort of from the same medieval place that ice harvesting was um, before we had other ways to make energy. Now we have other ways to make energy. So, um, you know, we need a planet that's livable. Um, and there are, are alternatives. In New Hampshire, where I live, uh, the subs subsidies killed some plants. And what the governor did uh, was take the money from the subsidies and put them into job training programs for the people that work in the woods. There are, you know, people just have to adapt. I don't mean to sound cavalier, but the time for wood burning is over and combustion kind of electricity. We need clean things. We have to have a livable planet. The climate is warming. Those are all facts. So uh, we just have to adapt. Great, thanks, Chris. Pete, would you like to to, to make yeah. some comments on that? Yeah, I certainly would because, like Chris, this is this is a dreadfully frustrating, um, hard to argue with when you're talking to politicians um, because they um, speak um, with the authority of the votes that put them in office. Um, but um, it's it's nonsense. It's free market nonsense. This is this is the the, 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 the ignorance of, of the idea of perpetual growth in a finite world. Um, where is the policy decisions being made to affect a just transition? It's not happening anywhere. It's been left to the free market, and that is not going to save us. We cannot rely on Elon Musk and Richard Branson to get us out of this mess. We need programmatic just transition and believe me um there are more jobs in the green economy because um we need to get rid of our pesticides so we need more people working on the land um and in the forests um we we, we have to shift from the techno um uh, te technochemical solutions to um human uh, need to um more human-based solutions and that means more jobs um but but it is an illusion, as Chris said, that, and, and Lisa also said, that um, the, the jobs that we will lose in the fossil fuel or the biomass industries will be gone forever. Um, no, there, 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 there are quite as many jobs and more in the green uh, alternatives than there are actually in, in, um, the, in those industries. Um, I, I thought it was good, um, Suzanne, that you mentioned the CEO of Drax said that, that, that they um, provide employment for 50,000 people. You know, that, that includes the news agent at a, in a village 30 miles away from Selby, where, where, where Drax Power Station is. And they say, well, the guy who gets on the bus to come to Drax every morning buys his newspaper there, you know, so that's keeping him in employment. That's the kind of nonsense of the job that we're talking about. Drax employs, I think, maybe 700 people. I'm not quite sure. I could be wrong about that. Um, and, 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 you know, um, there was outrage in Ireland when, it was talk when, they, when they talked about shutting down the, the, um, the peat burning power station at Eden Derry, and they said 140 jobs are going to be lost. When I did some investigation into those figures, um, I discovered that 70 of those jobs were um, on zero hours contracts, and they were not actually working full weeks. And they were in competition with each other for those places. It was a horrible existence for those 70 people who were clinging to their rent paying um, jobs on zero hours contracts. So uh, it's hogwash. Or uh, as my friend um, Jack from the USA says, uh, horse feathers. Great, great Marx Brothers uh, analogy. Thanks, Feet. Um, we have only a, a, a minute or so, so left. Thank you for those responses. It, it feels to me that um, one, that was one very important element of defeating fracking in, in the UK. Not the only element, um, but one element was to, to expose these arguments over the jobs um, and that it wasn't really going to bring you know, substantial numbers of jobs. A lot of the jobs would come um, from people coming in and then leaving the area, as you said, Lisa. So I think it was a, it was one element of, of, of defeating the arguments over fracking, as well as the safety elements, as well as the elements in terms of the impact on the community, and that there were alternatives to it. So it feels to me like a really important part of what we need to be doing um, as, as part of the ongoing campaigning around, around this issue is to really expose the arguments around jobs and 
that there are alternatives, real alternatives, and the kind of work that people want to do. But it comes back to the points that Sam was making about, about public ownership, about um, infrastructures that aren't dominated by big business interests, but actually dominated by the interests of you know, the community and, 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 and the nationalised industries or, or public ownership industries, I, I should say. Um, I'm going to give um, an opportunity to our speakers to have one final comment that they might want to make. Um, and then I'm going to just do some, some couple of advertisements of upcoming events. Um, so I'm going to go the other way around this time. I'm going to start with you, Pete. I'm going to go to Chris. I'm going to finish up with Lisa. Um, so we're going to, I'm inviting you to make a minute of final comments uh, to um, your audience here on the webinar. And then a couple of things just to point people in the direction of future campaigning. Pete, off you go. Unmute yourself. Yeah, gotcha, yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you to those who've added their, their, um, names to our uh, mailing list and um, that's that's greatly appreciated that's what we need uh, people power um person by person footstep by footstep we're we're, we're getting there we're, we're getting results um the grand illusion um of carbon neutrality um is where this whole thing falls right down it is a con um and the um subsidies are uh, a fraudulent way of extracting money from the public for um, shared dividends and profit to um, a small minority. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Great way to finish. Chris? I, I don't have a minute's worth left in me, um, <laughs> but thanks, thanks for watching the film. Uh, and do something. If it's not this issue, pitch in somewhere to make a difference. That's all we can do. And while Lisa thinks of her final words, I just want to pick up on Pauline in the chat. So Pauline has asked, will the webinar be put online to watch later? Yes, it will. It's something Pauline says that my trades council might be interested in seeing together with a short version of the film. So I just really want to, before I bring in Lisa for those final words, really want to re echo Pauline's suggestion idea i think this is what one of the things that we have to dedicate ourselves to doing coming out of this web webinar not just with the people here but via our networks this film needs to be seen it needs to be seen within the trade union movement and i think we have to do what we can now to really organize a bit of a systematic push um, across our trade union branches to get this film seen to get the speakers the speakers in wherever and have that discussion, the, the same discussion that we've been having tonight. We need to finish up with a, there are alternatives to the jobs that have been offered here. And it's absolutely crucial that we don't go down this dangerous um, climate and uh, nature destroying uh, route, which will essentially, as Pete says, just line the pockets of a small number of very wealthy corporations already. Lisa, final comments from yourself. Lisa, talk about screenings. Talk about screenings? Um, yeah, actually... <laughs> to get a hold of us to talk about screening. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I just, I wanted to say, um, I was thinking of something that Eldridge Cleaver said back in the 60s. He said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So for me, that means when somebody says, Oh, biomass, it's great. It's renewable. Challenge them. It's not renewable. The other thing, so we need to get rid of that classification of biomass as a renewable energy, as I said earlier. And the subsidies, you know, you're all paying for them in the UK. We're all paying for them all over the world. Drax would be in the red if it didn't get those subsidies. It wouldn't be a viable industry. So the subsidies have to go. And I think the two words that really like sort of encapsulate everything we've been talking about are just transition. It needs to be just in all ways. This transition to a different climate policy that we have for this planet needs to be just. 
And um, the other thing is get in touch with us if you in any way um, want us involved in future screenings like this. Um, and the other thing is one of the questions was put it on YouTube. We will put it on YouTube. I agree. I think we tried to do it at one point and we had issues, but we'll do it. We'll put it on YouTube. There's no reason not to. The broader audience, it, the broader the audience, the better. Thank you. Great. At least said that, that, that was a, a great place to finish both, both um, as a call to arms um, um, with the quote from Eldridge Cleaver and the asks for people in terms of their own activism and what they can do, but also practically in terms of getting it up there on YouTube and, and getting out to, to that bigger audience as much as we can in the UK and broader. Um, could I ask Chris and Lisa to just put any contact details into the chat um, that would be useful for, for people to get in touch with them? Uh, Lisa, did you want to say something? No. Okay. okay. And I, I just... I, I put the uh, web address for the film in, in there already. Great. Um, I, there's been a bit of chat um, as we were talking about fracking and the extent to which fracking is finished in the UK as opposed to pushed back. So I take on board those, those comments that we have to stay vigilant and continue to campaign against fracking. Mm -hmm. Any uh, uptake of that? Um, in, in the UK. But uh, just to echo Joshua's point, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, very much thank you for making the film a very, very powerful, uh, important campaigning tool. It's now our job in the UK to amplify the work that Biofuel Watch have done through our own campaign against climate change trade union networks and really take up um, the, the crucial campaign here in, in, in the UK. Um, I'd like to finish just by inviting people, thanking everybody again, and just by inviting people um, to uh, another film screening, uh, mapping out a just transformation. Uh, let me just read to you the next upcoming film screening. So in 2018, Real News has already been mentioned today, went on a 14 week tour of North America to look at grassroots struggles around climate change, particularly struggles around a just transition. Lisa's final comments there from fossil fuels to renewable energy, where workers and communities control the process so that they benefit from the transition and around the just recovery. Recovery from extreme weather events which do not exacerbate current inequalities. What we found were inspiring and visionary struggles all over the continent of the uh, USA, led by working class communities of color with people organizing just transitions and just recoveries themselves. And now you can see what we found. So we'll be joined um, next week. Uh, we'll get the details out to you uh, by Real News and some of the activists that they spoke to in, in the United States. And uh, that will be a really important contribution to our um, discussion about mapping a just transition or just transformation. That's what we need. Um, thanks again to everybody. I hope you enjoyed tonight. Uh, do continue to stay active and uh, let's unite those struggles for the transition of our society. Thanks everybody. Thanks to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, again. thanks Chris. Thanks Lisa so much. Bye bye thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody for tuning in too. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Bye.